Um, but yeah, no, it works out well. <laughs> I'm sure that I, uh, which one? I should put a fog machine down here. If I don't actually want to sit in fog all day, I don't feel like it's wise for anyone no, to no. sit in fog. You're gonna like um, go to the doctor in uh, in 30 years, and you're gonna be like, "Were you like sitting in a room with a fog machine for yeah. like 24 hours?" Whatever. I'm like, no, on set doing it all day. Like I have to like leave the warehouse and like go breathe fresh oxygen. Like I have to make a point of like, otherwise I just feel leaving. I leave there feeling so bogged down. I mean, it just yeah, it's bad air all day. I hate that fog looks so cool. Because, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, fog machines suck. It's, Anytime I play it on a stage with a fog machine, you're breathing that shit in. I'm just like... <laughs> it's one of those things that's, like, mandatory. And the more that I get into film, the more, like, in every single scene, like, even when it's not, like... We think of fog as, like, the big, obvious, like, like ominous city thing or whatever. Like, the big, yeah. dense city yeah, fog. Yeah, very, like, like, noir, kind of. But even yeah. in, like, very casual, like, modern family house scenes, like, there will be a little bit of fog in there just to really? enhance the atmosphere. Yeah, almost always. Like, it's that's fascinating. it's in, like, 100% like of things. Horror, but yeah, it's, it makes sense in, right. yeah, in the, the times where we associate fog. There's plenty of stuff we think, but, like, it's such a powerful tool to make everything just look better and more <laughs> dense and... The yeah, it creates more depth of field and like it just makes everything look more cinematic to use the word That's that everyone hates and can't stand. Yeah. Um hell yeah, dude. Episode 41. Uh something for everyone. <laughs> I was gonna ask you to say your full name before we started, but now I'm gonna try it live on air because I can. Uh so it's gonna be Zachary Chev Rier Ferreira. I feel like that's a pretty very close, white pretty American. close. So the, the, hang on, the hang middle. on. Let me let me try with a better accent here, because I think that was my problem. It's gonna be like Zachary. Chevrier Ferreira? Ferreira? Yeah, that's that's pretty close. Chevrier yeah. Ferreira? So the, the, chev the Chevrier is French, okay. so it's Chevrier, and then the Ferreira is just full Portuguese, so yeah. Hell yeah. So you could do like a Chevrier Ferreira. <laughs> Hell yeah. Throw dude. it on out there, you're fine. I'm another hyphenated last name, and I imagine you yeah. had the same trouble, trouble I did of every standardized test growing up, everything that requires you to put your name in a, in a bubble sheet. Oh, it's yeah. been a disaster. And just oh, the word, the like, do you have the same thing? I'll have to show you my license after this. Do you have the same thing where your names are just fucking smushed together? Oh, I think mine doesn't even have my whole last name on it. I think oh, I, like, word. I think just, they just like, like cuts cut, it off. Yeah, a couple of letters. Um, I had a couple jobs where like they would cut off like the A, so it would be Ferrer mm -hmm. or something like that. But there was this one time I was working at a grocery store when I was in like high school where they cut the Y off of Zachary out of everything. So like I come in and everybody's looking at me like, you don't look like a Zakar. Like I, th I thought that was going to be like some dude from like That's so Africa funny. or Asia coming up here and he's just some <laughs> white dude. And then it's just like, no, I had Zachary. They just fucked it up. My <laughs> peak was, uh, I played sports growing up and I can never get like, I, everyone in sports has your last name on Jersey, right? Like that's the iconic yeah. thing. And I could never get out. I would do like Jones or Jones T or JT. And finally my JT senior works, year yeah. of tennis, uh, I played tennis in high school. Cause yeah. Nice. Uh, what do we call it? I was like the captain of the team and I was in charge of making the jerseys. And I was like, fuck it. No one can stop me. Like, I'm the one typing in people's names. I'm putting Jones Tor Gross on the back of this motherfucker. <laughs> and it wrapped like the whole like <laughs> full semicircle. And I swear, I thought they were like charges extra for the amount of letters and shit. Like that, it was crazy. But it was the best. It made me so happy. And it's an absurd looking thing. Uh, yeah, but it's I would, great. I would always have the coaches just come up to me and be like, we're just going to do forever. And I'm like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> what uh, did you play growing up? Um, not a lot. I got put into the arts pretty quick because yeah. I had, uh, I had a couple of aggression issues when I was a kid, <laughs> but I feel like that's just like a lot of kids. And, sure. Like, I don't know. Um, wasn't as aggressive as some of the other kids. I'm like, but I did, you know, the, the, the sweet, I did like a little bit of soccer mm -hmm. and I sucked at it. So I stopped doing that. And yep. then I did some baseball and baseball was boring and I lived in a very swampy area. So I was just getting eaten alive by mosquitoes the whole time. These chairs really do just sink. I got to get better ones. Yeah. That's, <laughs> I was just talking about with Kevin that they like, they've been like bad and they recently just like fell off a cliff into like yeah. Narnia. So I apologize for that. I thought mine is the worst one, uh, which doesn't make anything better, but I did try. Uh, can you just slide this a little closer to you at all? Oh yeah, absolutely. Pull arm moves all, all can get better. The, uh, um, but the, yeah, the only one that I really like, I played some basketball and I loved basketball, but the, uh, but the only one I never really tried was uh football because I was kind of a run until like the middle of high school and then okay. I just shot up. So <laughs> hell yeah. Uh, I wanted to, before we get into all the Euclid stuff, all the fun stuff today, uh, I'll get into get plugs out of the way. So what does Euclid have coming up? Anything coming up that people should be aware of? Anything that is out now that people should go listen to? Shows coming up. Yeah. What is happening in the Euclid world that people need to go check out right now? Absolutely. Um, yeah, we've got Revilement, which came out, um, how many months ago is it now? Not that long. It came out in the middle of the summer. Um, and, you know, on the back of that, there's uh, all the music videos that we have on our YouTube mm -hmm. and all of that. Uh, we do have a show coming up on the 29th of this month, October. 
um, which we're thinking we're going to have our new merch on display there. I think we just solidified the deal for it. Hell yeah. Like yesterday or maybe earlier today. Anything you can say about what merch items is more t-shirts, obviously like more shirts. Uh, I think we want to diversify, but like shirts, Mm -hmm. people love shirts. So that's what we got going on. Uh, but I'm, we're all pretty hyped on the new designs. They look pretty sick. So. Is there any like weird merch items mix in? And I ask because like I've always heard bands. It's like everyone sells T-shirts, but I've always heard bands say that like when they sell booty shorts, when they sell leggings, when they sell grinders, like those things yeah. go hot because no one else has, has them, and there's yeah. something nuanced and cool about them. Do you have anything in the pipe like that? Have you had experience with selling weird merch items like that? Like <laughs> no experience uh, selling anything like that. No, I mean we have the pretty standard suite. We got like shirts, sweatshirts. Mm-hmm. We have the the dad hats as yep. people call them now. Um, I would love to branch out and do something weird. Like I remember going to like Warp Tour when I was like 14 or something. And I think it was like, bring me the horizon just Mm -hmm. had like the fucking, the big booty shorts that had their name right Mm -hmm. across the back. And I was like, that's wild. (laughs) (laughs) It was, uh, yeah, it's, it's different. I like different merches and there's also, you know, there's, there's the sense where you have to have something that people are going to buy. Mm -hmm. Cause a lot of people will see the novelty and be like, oh, that's cool, but I'm not going to get it. That's me. A hundred percent. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, whereas something like more universal, like even just like pins or something like that, I feel like a lot of people have been bringing the battle jackets back. Mm-hmm. So I think like a pin or like a nice suite of like stickers and patches and stuff like that. I think that would be pretty easy to put together, but we, my, haven't, like, we haven't gotten there yet. Marketing entrepreneur brain is also like, yes, pins and stickers are great because you get people to spend $1 and all you really want them to do is open their wallet. And once it's open, then they will more likely buy a t-shirt. Just be like, oh, maybe I'll buy an album and, too. Yeah. yeah. And it's an easy way to entice more people. And ultimately that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to enhance more foot traffic get more people to buy the shirt and get more gas in the tank and not so you can make more money but the record can be done sooner can be done by someone better can be exactly. done Plus, bigger you can have wizard head do another music video oh, for you guys, yeah, whatever that, that would be sick yeah. I, I love that dude um yeah it's it's one of those things too where like you can like bundle things together mm-hmm. just people love bundles of course so you can just be like oh like if you buy x amount you get like a free sticker or a mm-hmm. free pen or whatever and yep. then that's always kind of like another Another draw for people because it's nice to just be able to get like your your emblems or your brands or whatever it is out there because mm-hmm. like I don't like you were saying it's not even about like you know I'm not trying to like take everybody's money I'm just tr- or we're not trying to take everybody's money it's more about just like putting ourselves more out there through our yeah. our branding our merch so. I wish we were doing well enough that many money went into my pocket <laughs> like yeah. that's why I say about music videos right it's like I'm gonna charge you an amount and it's gonna seem like a lot of money but like I promise you most of that money doesn't go to my pocket most of it is going to the camera and the location of the gas and the time and the hours and all this blah 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 and by the end it's like yeah, there's some left for me I'm making a living off of it but yeah I think oftentimes people underestimate or overestimate rather yeah <laughs> what that living is basically yeah I mean they pretty much I think all of our merch sales so far have gone into buying more merch mm-hmm. <laughs> for more people to buy. It's just going to be a, a cycle for a while. Yep. And it'll take uh, many of those cycles before you can afford one of the cabs that it takes you to get on stage or Correct. one of the guitars or yeah. one drum from Matt's kid. Matt has way too many cymbals and drums. And oh, dude, yeah. But, but I mean, kid, but. the kit that he got recently looks real good, especially it's on our last show. Oh, my God. Unbelievable. Thing, yeah. Thing looks sick. I love that he uses every inch of it, too. It's fun to watch him perform. It's just like a, it feels like a very different to what I see a lot of other drummers do and I don't know drums well enough to like articulate or say why it's different how it's different but I like it it's fun and it's yeah entertaining to me to watch yeah Matt's Matt's an absolute joy to watch Mm -hmm. play behind the kit like it's um it's like one of those deals where you just see somebody who has like mastery over a system Mm -hmm. where they're able to kind of get every inch of what they want out of something yeah and I, I don't know if this would be in his words, but I think that he has achieved like at least a level of mastery over his instrument where mm-hmm. he is able to pretty much just like bleed it dry for every sound he wants. I I love that. And I think that that's always sentiment. He sat in your chair and I'll tell you that he didn't say that. <laughs> and of course he didn't say that, right? No one does. Uh, but I think that that's such an important reminder to me of like how how differently we view ourselves and our own creations from everyone else's where it's like, I know that those aren't his words, but I agree with you. I agree that I would, yeah, put him in that whatever top percentage category of like, now there's few people who can do it. That guy does, yeah. but that's not how he feels. And I think it's a really important to be aware of both of those of like, yeah, we're all 
kind of, we all feel the same to some degree. Like we all feel like we have done something. We are good at something. You can play bass. There's no question you can play bass. Yeah. But there is, I'm sure in your brain, you're looking at whatever the toast and the bossies of the world going like, do I even know this instrument? Like, have I even played this thing before? And I'm forgetting of Tosin's guitar, maybe. So I apologize if that's the wrong example. But Well, it's uh, funny. Do you know Evan Brewer at all? I don't think I do. Oh, uh, you should. Okay. Um, so Evan Brewer, he's, he's in, um, uh, what did he just, he just played on an album by Fallujah. Okay. Yep. He's on Fallujah's newest album, but he's got quite the pedigree. He's done solo stuff. And he's been in the Faceless, and he was uh, he was the founding basis of like Entheos and Animosity mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And he started off in a uh, in a metalcore band with Tosin, and is the person who taught Tosin how to slap. <laughs> and he's just an insane bassist. He is Interesting. unbelievable. He's kind of like I don't know. I, I don't even. He has a very unique style because he has a lot of like you know death metal chops, mm -hmm. but he's also got like the kind of Ryan Martini from Mudvayne, kind of like just like very solid slapping, tapping, sweeping. Like he can, he can do a little bit of everything, and he's incredible to watch play. <laughs> I only ever saw him the once, but it was pretty mind blowing. I appreciate ignoring me putting my jacket on. You talked through it like a pro. You just <laughs> kept on rolling while I'm over here making a hey, mess. You're cold, man. I'm not everything up. Dude, you gotta look good. I don't want the jacket on the back of the coat. It's supposed to be on me. It's supposed to look like it's true. It's kind of like um, it's like a plaid version of the uh, what the Talking Heads guy was wearing. <laughs> I don't know what that means or if it's a compliment or an insult, but thank you either. It's a compliment. <laughs> Hell yeah, I'll he, take he it. He looks sharp. I can never uh, remember his name. But. I, I will hope. I wish it was an insult because it would be way funnier for you to come here in the first 10 minutes like be taking <laughs> shots at you. me. <laughs> <laughs> like, that, that would suck. But there's a part of my brain that would be like, that actually kind of respect. Kind of cool. That's kind of cool. Uh, one thing in the plugs. I always forget to do my own plugs when we're doing them. Please do. Uh, my quick thing is that I just sent out finals for like a really ambitious VFX project. Uh, so it's my first like fully... CG music video and I guess what that means is like uh, it's my first one with like full band performances and nothing done practically so it's all composited it's all uh, all stuff and I'm very excited about it and as I was thinking about it today it was making me laugh I guess kind of going back to the Matt conversation of like I'm so excited about this and I'm about to sit here and talk to you about the River Pig video, which I think is like the coolest thing I've ever seen. It makes mine look like a very, you know, a singular drop in an ocean of, of skill and yeah, ability. I'll have to check yours out um, too. Definitely show that to me after um, this. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm excited for it. And I'm excited. Yeah. It should be out at some point in the future. But yeah, I just sent off the finals and got the mats. And it's one of those things that I did 90% of like months ago and then finally got the final mix of the song. So we could then find, go and fine tune everything. Mm. Uh, but I'm excited about it. Uh, and I kind of wanted to, yeah, use that to jump off into the River Pig video. So I understand that. Or I guess for context here, River Pig uh, was one of the singles off the album. Uh, you put out a music video that I know you filmed with Eric DiCarlo, and I mm -hmm. think you filmed it in like a outdoor woodsy shed thing. Um, yeah, it was not terribly far from here. I think it's kind of like equidistant between you and Kevin. It's like maybe like 20 minutes north of here. It's a, cool. It's a paintball arena Okay, that yes, he used yes, to go exists. to all the time. Um, um, and deep in the woods, there's like this old kind of like, I guess a fort you would call it. Sure. Um, that's just built out of like some like driftwood and planks and stuff. But it really popped for what we wanted to use it Absolutely. for. Absolutely. Uh, and so, of course, you film that, you get the get the edit back. Uh, and then there's you know, a conversation of like, well, how do we enhance this, right? And I think everyone has this, uh, I like the idea that a music video is about making a moment. And there is something to be said of like, we've seen a lot of music videos. How do you stand out and make something that people haven't seen? How do we make something that stands out in people's minds and that when they think about this thing, Euclid is the only thing they think about. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's probably where some of this came from is this Riverhead, I, or uh, Riverhead, <laughs> Wizardhead <laughs> for River Pig uh, music video came about. Uh, so I think from what I've heard from Maddie and Kevin, you were kind of the, the contact there for getting that going, getting that ball rolling. Uh, where does this process start to take shape? Where does this AI video start to kind of come alive in your brain? So this was, I want to say, maybe a couple months after the Iniquity video came out. So mm -hmm. it was before we had any of like the final plans for everything mm -hmm. set up. We knew we wanted to do mu more music videos. Sure. And of course, you know, get the whole album and everything together with it, which is its own process. Yep. But um, there was this guy on Reddit, which I kind of handle a lot of the social media aspects of Reddit mm -hmm. as far as Euclid goes and, you know, just putting out videos and uh, promoting the band mm -hmm. and stuff. And uh, there was this guy, Brendan Baldwin, who is Wizardhead, um, who his work has just always been phenomenal. And he was starting out in the very infancy of AI with just like putting together live footage of like Meshuggah videos yep. and just putting like Eldritch filters or like some sort of strange like stable diffusion thing over them. 
And every time I saw it, I was just like, this is blowing me away. It was always like really cool and terrifying. And I just like on a whim contacting him, contacted him, not expecting like anything back. Cause when you just shoot a message into the internet, you're never sure if it's even going to be seen, let alone like answered, especially on Reddit. I don't really like, I know I handle a lot of the stuff there, but I don't understand it very well. I want to interject for two seconds. One, he's like from Europe somewhere, right? He's no, no. He's like Midwest. Oh, he is. Okay. He is American. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one. And then two is, is, as you're becoming a fan of him, is he like, I mean, like what group you like, I guess I'm in like a lot of video editing subreddits and that's why I lot pay a lot of attention to, or I guess maybe the blender one is the better example here. Like, was he the guy on the front page of the blender subreddit every day or just like some guy that you happen to see in the, in the subreddit and you're like, Oh, that's the one, you know what I'm saying? So I don't, I actually don't follow a lot of AI stuff personally. I think okay. I saw him in, it was either the gent or the prog metal subreddit. Okay. Uh, just putting forward this video and they had like a bunch of upvotes. So okay. I checked it out. Yeah. I should have had the regular water. The <laughs> sparkling water's killing me right now. Feel free to open a wa regular water as well. They're right there as well. Yeah, but it's you so all. tasty. Um, they, they are um, <laughs> guilty as you are. It's a yeah. catch twenty two. <laughs> speaking of uh, speaking of masuga, um, but yeah, um, he had done a bunch of these masuga videos, and I shot a message out to mm -hmm. him, and he was just like, "Yeah, do you have any like examples or anything like something you'd want to see like some of my work done like immediately?" And I was like, okay, cool. So I sent him the Iniquity video mm -hmm. and he sent us like a demo that's just Iniquity with like a very similar filter, um, which I'll have to show you sometime. That's, that, that I didn't one, know that existed. Yeah, it's sick. It How looks much, really cool. Uh, with like the same River Pig style visual? Yeah. How much of Iniquity is it? Whole thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's not online anywhere. It's just in my Dropbox. He just but. volunteered a free music video as like a sample. Yeah. Then <laughs> I have. Yeah, he's he's a he's an angel. I have angel. so many questions of this. Wait, then I know that they're um, jumping ahead in the process here. I know in the River Pig video, there's a lot of like revisions of getting the the coding right and getting all the AI to output things that mm -hmm. were. I think I think it was Matt who said there was like numbers and letters mixed in that didn't quite belong. Or yeah. Some so I think glitch. that was. I'm sorry. I'm, I don't mean to cut you off. Yeah. I'm yeah. Just, I'm, Bad in interviews. Um, so it's one of those deals where I believe some of Eric's footage had like the uh, I don't know what the term for it is, but like the edges of the camera would have like the uh, like the number of the camera or whatever oh. it is had like letters and stuff on it because it was okay. just the rough footage yeah, yeah, yeah. that he forwarded to Brendan mm -hmm. or forwarded to us that we forwarded to Brendan. Um, so like there were a couple artifacts left um, okay. inside of the video where it would just like have like a word just like off in the corner or like on someone's face or something. Um, so then is the iniquity full video exists is it with these same imperfections like it's just straight up he took our vid like the full video mm -hmm. finished yep. by by Eric um, and just kind of like put a filter over it It doesn't look nearly as professional it still looks cool but Got you know okay. he didn't uh, he didn't like have it in his hands like he didn't like upscale it or anything oh, like that okay, this was okay, just okay, the okay. sample so sorry if I uh, no worries no, you there. I, <laughs> no worries yeah he, it's um so he did that, and then I was like, we have to use this guy. Of course. Um, he's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just kind of like pushing and pushing and pushing, and then eventually like we got to the stuff with River Pig, and it was kind of this like blessing in disguise where I believe Eric got a new computer or something, and something about some of the old River Pig files of like the finalized version we were going through were corrupted. Oh, so, I didn't know that part of the story either. So That's cool. we had this, uh, we still had this like good chunk of footage, but like it was, uh, I, I'm not sure exactly because I think it sure. was in like Matt's hands mostly. I could be wrong there. No worries. He'll yeah. chastise me if I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> oh, well, something happened. Yeah. Yeah, something happened. There we go. That's a good way to put it. <clears throat> um, and uh, yeah, so. Something happened with the footage, so I, there was a, a working edit to some degree, but then something went wrong, and so that's where Wizardhead then becomes like a, a, a viable Correct. option. I was like, yeah, like, let's just forward it to him. Gotcha. And uh, he knocked it out of the fucking park. Yeah. He did such a good job. Uh, talk to me about that like revision process. Yeah, talk to me about, I guess, the process of that. I mean, did you send him a, a draft of a video from Eric and then get a full draft of it? Did you get 30 seconds back and give some feedback on we want yeah how did that kind of process yeah go? at first he sent stills he mm -hmm. was just like is this like the aesthetic you want and that was mostly like i helped a lot with the communication aspect mm -hmm. but it was mostly kevin's vision because he had an idea of how he wanted it to look okay um so i was kind of playing middleman there for a little bit but he would send stills and i would send it to the chat mm -hmm. and like a couple of people would look at it <laughs> and um <laughs> Yeah, two people, the same two people were always in the chat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you'd hear a little... I mean, it was one of those things where everybody was on board, but not everybody really knew what to expect. Yep. 
because like we had seen like a couple AI videos, but like we were right when a bunch of them were starting to come out at once. Arcs mm -hmm. came out, so we didn't really see the full capabilities and so like com or I shouldn't call them competitors, but other peers yeah. uh, were putting theirs out. And I think to be fair, I didn't really know. I mean, I think it's uh, um. Uh, I'm internally referencing something in a book I, a book I read, but that's totally relevant now. And I'm realizing that's a, a tangent that's not worth fully unraveling to get to the point I want to make. Mm. Uh, and so what I'm thinking of here uh, is that now I have no idea. Oh, uh, as a video person, I didn't even really understand what you were talking about. And this is like someone who like I have proposed, I've pitched AI ideas to other bands. Like I've explored what AI in a music video could look like. And as Kevin was first telling me like, oh, we have this AI video in the works. It didn't like, I don't know. I didn't know that it was going to be what River Pig turned out to be. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, yeah, to me, it's like even someone who works in video had no idea, couldn't imagine what you're doing. So I can imagine with the band, it's tough to like buy into you saying like, yeah, I found this guy on Reddit and he's top of the line. And they're like, cool, but like, yeah, kind that's of. hard to buy into. Yeah. Well, that's why when he sent the example, like Maddie and Kevin mm -hmm. were looking at it and they were like, okay, this is pretty safe. Yeah. And then like, as the stills were coming out and he was sending like small blurbs and uh, kind of uh, what, teasers and mm -hmm. such, we were like, okay, this is starting to look really insane. Mm -hmm. And then he was just like, okay, do you want me to like upscale it and do all this other stuff? And he did. And it came out looking the way it does. And it's Incredible. Real good. Chef's kiss. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the, the success of it has been, it's kind of spoken for itself since then. It's gotten to over 100,000 views now, I think. It's close to 110. Like 110, now. yeah. Which for uh, us was, yeah, it, it blew us away. Unbelievable. Yeah. What's Wild. that felt like? Have you had a response like that in a music video before? Or was no. this like the <laughs> biggest response? Okay. Yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely like 10 times more than even our previously most popular stuff. Like Hell yeah really rocketed us and I mean it's still we're still a little bit riding the wave on it because like it's been popular on Spotify and mm -hmm. Apple Music as a result um, so yeah it's been it's it's been a pretty cool ride have and you guys explored the TikTok side of it that is not my purview I'm a, I'm a crotchety old grandpa when it comes to TikTok me too but uh but yeah definitely I I realize that that is like a really good avenue for marketing right now it's just mostly handled by I think Kevin and Maddie okay um we all kind of like have small chunks of it that we take care of, which makes everything a lot more manageable. Because mm -hmm. back in the IDAT days, fucking Maddie, the poor guy, was just like <laughs> shouldering the whole burden. He had a full head of hair when that band started. <laughs> he did. <laughs> Shout out, Maddie. This is two episodes in a row. I'm taking stray shots at him out of nowhere. But Dude, he's fine. He's, yeah. he's, an abs he's an actual <laughs> angel. He's like one of... <laughs> One of the best people the I've best. ever met. He's such a good dude. Which is why I'm comfortable taking straight shots at him on a podcast, which is so fucked up that it's like because he's nice, it's then funny to like throw shots at him. Oh, same. But, I constantly um, fuck with him. Yeah. But well, that's because I love him. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, but anyway, back in the depth of Tide's days, he had to be the one, yeah, shouldering all of it. And scenario, you're saying you guys have all like separate roles in the band. Uh, what are the things you feel like you handle the most? Or I'm sure there's some cross pollination happening, but yeah, what are the things that you take the lead on oftentimes? Uh, there is definitely a lot of cross pollination. I'm kind of the, uh, the zany kind of like, mad scientist idea guy because mm -hmm. like I do have a lot of ideas that get implemented but for yeah. like every one of those ideas is another 10 ideas that it's just like no we're not doing that dude mm -hmm. um, I just throw everything at a wall and just see what sticks because usually when it sticks you get stuff like the river pig video or yeah. um, I composed a couple of the song or composed most of the song because we all it's like kind of a collaborative mm -hmm. but separate thing um, but like escape and uh, Last Victim were two of my, um, and uh, Unit were, mm -hmm. were songs that I was composing. Um, some of those had been, some of the riffs had been sitting around for a long time. So I do like a compositional aspect. Um, I handle Reddit. I set up our band camp and handle pretty much all of that, which was good because we've been, it's slowed down now, but like, you know, band camp was a good avenue for us to go down. I'm mm -hmm. kind of kicking myself for not setting it up earlier because it's like, a lot of people want to support the bands that they love in a more direct way and just mm -hmm. like are either ignorant or kind of like don't have the means to through one way or another. So when you have like a, a donation or, you know, very minimally pay uh, system based mm -hmm. off of 
something like Bandcamp. It's the merch it's, pins of the merch booth, awesome. right? It's the same. Yeah. I, I don't know if that was at the start of the podcast or right before we actually went on it. I think it was at the start of this. So we talked about it. Um, but yeah, the same we idea. Do a lot just of talking. <laughs> giving people a little, little step in. Uh, that's interesting then. So I wanted to dive back into like the kind of the origin story here. So I know you as a basis of Euclid. I know you've written songs with them. I know you, yeah, I kind of know the, the end product or where we are as the current end product maybe. Uh, and I guess maybe you call it a work in progress still. But I'm curious, yeah, where does things start? Are you a bassist from the time you can walk? Where does music come into your life? Uh, when I was a kid, I wanted to play drums. And my mom said, fuck no. <laughs> because who wants to listen to a kid stumble through a drum set yep. for X amount of years until they're any good at it? Uh, yeah. Uh, shout out to Kowanowski's mom or whoever was living with him at the time. Because yep. I, I don't think I could do that. <laughs> yeah. I still... Um, I still have trouble hearing drums as music. I've joked many, I've said many times on the podcast, I'm going to get an ECAT, I'm going to make myself learn drums, and I've I've given up on saying it because I've been saying it for so long that I feel bad not having done it yet, but I am determined. Like, it is in the back of my brain, it's like, that will happen. But even as someone who's inclined to music, like, I still have trouble hearing drums as music. Like, I can hear a guitar and it sounds like it's singing to me, mm -hmm. but converting the drums, it's like, I feel like I could hear someone play my favorite song on drums, and it would still take me a good amount of time before I was like... Oh, I know this part. I get you. Like somehow it just doesn't quite click in the same, which makes it then enticing to go learn and try and tackle that monster in my brain. I get you. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm with your mom on that. I'm like, <laughs> I don't even like listening to good drummers sometimes. Yeah, and I get you. Much it's just less like, a four year old eh, trying to figure it out. Shut up. I'm trying to tune. Um, <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, it's one of those it's one of those deals where, like I said earlier, like kind of sports wasn't working out for me. So mm -hmm. so hot. So. Uh, my mom was like, we'll put you in the arts. There so you go. She uh, stuck me, she stuck a guitar in my hand and put me in guitar lessons. And I didn't actually really learn anything from those. Okay. I learned how to play like two songs. Is this middle covers. school, high school, elementary school? This was like, yeah, it was like middle school. It was like late elementary into middle school. Cool, okay. I think I was, yeah, yeah, it was right around there. Cool, okay. Um, and yeah, I learned like a couple covers, but that's it. Like I didn't really like learn to like the instrument because I, like I was saying before this, like I'm, I'm in that, uh, what was it? The, the formerly gifted kid, uh, <laughs> demographic where it's just like, didn't do homework, had ADHD and the mm -hmm. doctors were just like, here is just like a bunch of Adderall. You'll be fine. Uh, that'll <laughs> fix it for sure. <laughs> yeah. What could go wrong here? Go on to the world kid. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I just, uh, I, d I didn't really like learn anything from it because mm -hmm. my uh, my guitar teacher, bless his soul, he was a great dude, but he like made everything feel like homework. And I was just like, I'm not doing homework. Fuck that. Yeah. So I would just like not practice all week and then go in and he would just be like, oh, you're not any better. Did you practice? So I was like, nope. So I just kind of stumbled around and dicked around with guitar for a while. And then I don't remember what it was. I was still, I loved music. I had like just music from day of birth till today and still listen to all sorts of stuff because both of my grandmothers were super into music and I was with them all the time. Uh, one was like solely into classical and would only listen to classical. So it was a lot of, you know, it wasn't anybody super obscure. It was just, you know, like Ma, uh, Beethoven, Mozart, uh, Chopin was the biggest one, Frederick mm -hmm. Chopin, which uh, I still have a big connection to him through like the way I try to compose. I love just the feelings of all of his compositions. And then on the other side, my other grandmother was just like blues, classic rock, folk. That was her whole thing. So it was a lot of Elton John, a lot of James Taylor, a lot of the Beatles. For some reason, I thought you were going to say she was like a Metallica woman, and it was going to make sense in my brain. They're like, oh, there's the orchestral, and there's the Metallica. No, that's that was where... my dad. My dad, was, my dad okay. was like Metallica all the way up to like... He would... He started getting into some heavier stuff before he dialed it back when he was getting older. Sure. Like, he got me into, like, Korn and System of a Down okay. and a couple of those bands. And uh, a lot of the grunge stuff, you know, he was a huge Pearl Jam head, uh, Alice in Chains, which gotcha. is still one of my favorite bands. Um, and, you know, like, a lot of the stuff that I grew up with, like Led Zeppelin and stuff, like, you know, a lot of stuff everybody grows up with. Yeah. And then my mom was into, like, the weird shit. And okay. the weird shit is what I'm still really keyed into now, like Primus and Tool and, okay, like, yep. Deftones and Nine Inch Nails. Like, that was, like, big foundation for me, where mm -hmm. it's just, like, I like the weird shit. Give me more of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I still have, like, a little bit of all that. And, of course, the Grateful Dead. My parents were just huge <laughs> deadheads. Deadheads. That's funny. Would you agree that that is kind of then the recipe 
uh, some, it makes sense to me that that's a foundation for where Euclid is now and for what's kind of come out of you through the years through In Depth and Tide and now through Euclid of like, yeah, that is exactly kind of the recipe of like, there's the, the orchestral, symphonic, more composition based stuff. And there's the more head bang, like just what feels good stuff. And it makes yeah. sense that as those two things evolve over the course of a lifetime. And it's a struggle trying to make them meet sometimes sure. too, especially yeah. when like, cause I'll, I'll just, I'll, like I was saying, I'll just throw shit at a wall. Yep. I'll just have like a really weird song. And I just dealt with this with Maddie recently. He was just like, I like some parts of this, but like, this is, I don't like a lot of this, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, he was just like, this is just not Euclid. So, but I've we sit down and we chip away at it and see what we can make out of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I have a similar challenge with music videos sometimes of like a lot of what I listen to is rap. Like, I, I, I like, I like some rap, but I think sometimes it's just, it's different than what I'm working on. And that's important to me of like, I can't work all day on a metalcore song and then go listen to the record that sounds similar to that. Like I just, I need a different thing in my head. Yeah. It's like serious ear fatigue. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, really bad. Exactly. Yeah. I think it, I, fatigue's a great word. Though. I've never quite looked at it that way, but yeah, it's it great. Is, yeah. Cause your, yeah. your brain and your ears are just like tired of hearing the same thing. So yeah. you're just trying to like, if you diversify, it really helps. I've always said that I just need a new flavor sometimes. And I think fatigue is, yeah, the more articulate way to say that than saying I need a new ear flavor. Yeah, uh, I, I like ear flavor too, though. That's like marketable. Sure. Um, but yeah, no, the same thing where like my, my influence then oftentimes come from there. And I think I, in, in metal, I like to try and find ways to world meet. I think what rap does well is they, they sell things really well. And I think metal sometimes gets lost in trying to be articulate and, uh, they're trying to like do too much somehow. And I think rap is really good at just like, fuck it. We're just going to throw shit at a wall till it sticks. And it's fun to me to try and find where those two things overlap. And of course there's something to be learned and something to be detracted from both, both stances there. Um, but I feel you that it's tough sometimes to have these two kind of dueling influences is like, they don't really align. Like, uh, Chopin and Metallica really don't. No, uh, on there, paper, there are some, there's some crossover. Um, you hear stuff like the, the reprieve and master of puppets. It's like very compositionally sound. Okay. Like it has a very nice kind of like, counterpuntal line between the guitars and the rhythm kind of like flowing into each other. It's beautiful if mm -hmm. you really analyze it, but it is one of those deals where if you get lost in just like trying to make these big grandiose swells all the time, then like you were saying, it just kind of, it's like you're focusing on the wrong thing yep. while like somebody else is running away with the bag. But exactly so. that. Yeah. 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 And I think rap is so good at saying like, we're just going to put out singles forever. There's no need to get to an album. And in metal, there's this thing of like, let's get the perfect 12 songs. And it's like, you could have, there is something to be said for that. There is a, a mountain to be climbing. There is worth getting to the top of it. Um, but I think it's, yeah, I think there's a middle ground there, right? It's probably the best of both worlds. That yeah. and metal is starting to kind of adapt. Yeah. I'm, I am glad to see that. Mm -hmm. um, you see bands like Sleep Token and Spirit Box and... Um, even some of the larger bands, like I think like Bring Me the Horizon just recently, they've released like four or five singles already from their album coming out. Like mm. they're just shooting them out. Mm. I, so. There's the, to me, the cross pollination top, use that word too much for no reason. I'll have to figure out why that got into my brain today. But uh, the top of Post Malone and Billie Eilish to me are like, they're very much pop stars. They're very much like pop stars in the way that we thought of them, I guess, similar to like Avril Lavigne. Yeah. But they are blending a lot closer to the metal world. They're pulling everything in. And so I think, yeah, that's kind of the the merging there. We're seeing the metal world start to lean into singles. And we're starting to see them kind of lean into a more like maybe honest approach would be of like, I think there's something about Post Malone that feels very relatable, whereas a, a more polished celebrity maybe doesn't feel as relatable. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely feels more relatable. Um but I feel like that's a that's an inherent bias from my end because he's he was a metal guy. Yeah, who went to rap. I'd say rather than honest, I'd probably go with like it's just more artistic. Like sure. it's something that they are trying to put forth as a full piece. Like mm -hmm. they don't want you to like see glimpses of it because they want to have like this full like platter to serve it to you on mm -hmm. basically. Uh, <clears throat> is that like kind of your philosophy then when you're writing new material? Talking about like kind of throwing ideas at a wall. Uh, what does your writing process then look like? Is it sitting down at a computer and saying, what's going to come out of me today? Or is it waiting until something is playing in your head and then you sit at a computer and get that idea out of you? What is kind of the normal start for a Euclid song or for some of the songs you've written? Um, it's a little bit of both of those. <clears throat> um, it depends on the day and honestly the season because mm -hmm. there are certain winter, which is coming up and I'm very excited about, are... Uh, it's just like my best season for writing. Like I sit down and sometimes it doesn't even feel like I'm actually writing the music. It feels like it's just kind of happening through me. It's like conduit kind of stuff, which sounds very pretentious, but that's genuinely what it feels like. How do you think the seasons influence that? 
I feel like it's just different feel. I remember I watched the one that you just did with Kevin recently, and he was talking about how it's like listening to different music mm-hmm. in different seasons as an experience, and writing can be very similar to that. There are just different kind of mentalities that just sit upon you in different seasons. And in summer, I feel like almost like a little too like golden retriever energy. Like That's I can't, right. I can't yep. just sit there and just like write a song. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's a little, I'm a little too like hyperactive. So usually when I write stuff in like the spring, summer or early fall, it's like very disjointed. It's just like a bunch of different parts that I just threw together and I'm like, here you go, sort them out. <laughs> but like, if it's something in the winter, I'm just like, it's a little more slow, a little more methodical. You know, the weather is just kind of one of those things where you're, you typically are a little more introspective in mm-hmm. the winter um, because it's just, you know, it's gray, it's cold. You're not out and about doing as much usually. I've never thought about that in the context of my own art. Uh, I think I try and keep my office as constant as possible. And I usually I think of that in terms of light of like, I just can't have it bright in the morning and dark at night because then my video looks different in contrast. Like I, it's important to me to try and create a space that is as constant as possible, okay. regardless of light and weather. And if the sun's direct or if it's cloudy or something, like I just, I don't like having space that's variable. It's important to me. Yeah. I think I do better when things are constant and that kind of an honest look at my, my video. And in that, it's like I'm wondering that uh, I don't know how I'd ever find this out, but I'm wondering if I'm doing myself a disservice of not leaning into all the uh, variations of the universe. So it's interesting. I've never thought about taking inspiration from the season. I actually, but I guess it's yeah, I like the way that you subconscious. That. Um, but yeah, that's a really interesting, interesting idea. Yeah, I feel like that is kind of going into that. I, I hadn't really thought about it in that way that you just put. It's interesting just talking about it, actually. But the. Um, the idea of, yeah, like leaning into a very like relatable aspect of just like, I've heard more and more people as years have gone on talk about like seasonal depression mm-hmm. and things of that nature. And it does kind of feel like that. Like it's just like a more depressive atmosphere, but slowing down and having that like depressive, what's, what's the word that I'm looking for? I, I guess atmosphere again, even though I'm just repeating myself, <clears throat> uh, having that kind of atmosphere around is able to be utilized. Like you don't have to just mm-hmm. like lay back and just kind of like you can you can kind of pour that out into something, which that's helps me at least. It helps me not like be super depressed when it's gray. All yeah, the time. that's interesting. I I try and approach everything from a level ground, and my thought is like I don't want to I don't want to make the video angry because I'm in a bad mood today, or I don't want to make the video happy because I'm happy today. It's like. Mm-hmm. What is the video asking me to be? Is it asking me to be happy? Is it asking me to be sad? Mm. And I try and be very in tune to that. And I think similar to the weather, it's the more thing of like, I'm hearing you say like, I internalize the the somber energy and I turn that into art. And for me, it's like, no, no, no. I try and make sure that it's never somber or it's never happy, that I'm always approaching from the middle ground. um, And I guess maybe that's part of the process of like, you're you're creating from scratch and my creative is always kind of derivative of that initial creation, right? Like my, my video doesn't exist on its own. It is a, a, a built off the foundation of the song, whereas you're crafting the foundation from scratch. So there's a little more room for nuance, I guess. I suppose, but uh, I think that there's also a virtue to approach it from the way that you are and that that still has plenty of artistic integrity. And I think that if you were to apply our philosophies differently to our different aspects, you mm-hmm. can still come out the other end with something worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. I always find myself wondering of like, I don't know, we do everything the same way. And I'm like, is there a better way? Like, yeah, I, for me, it's like, I've, I've settled that being this in the sterile universe is for me the best. Uh, and it, I had, yeah, the moment of like, Oh fuck, I'd never considered that. Maybe I had to, you know, pick the wrong road in this, in this pursuit. I see what you mean. Um, and not that there is a right or a wrong road. I think, yeah, we all have our own recipe and whatever works for us. But yeah, um, like you said, I, I think that just looking at it of just like, did I do this the wrong way? I don't think that there is a, this is a, I did want to bring this, this one thing up just mm-hmm. because I, I remembered it randomly the other day when uh, Lex actually was asking me like, what are you going to talk about? And I was just like, I don't really know. <laughs> and I was just like, what do I want to talk about? Uh, the, do you know Zay Frank at all? I don't know if I do. He, uh, he has a YouTube channel and I think he worked for like Buzzfeed or something like that for a little while. Okay. Um, he does all those like true facts about the monkfish, like those videos, <laughs> shit like that. I'm sure. Yes, it's, um, that's very much me. Or maybe yeah. it was college humor he went for. But like okay. way back, like yeah. 2006, he had something called The Show with Zay Frank. And this predated like a lot of the YouTube stuff that's, go on, that's gone on since. Yeah. I think it's when YouTube was still like, you know, baby's first <laughs> video platform. <laughs> 
Which it somehow still is, and that's always something I forget. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> uh, but he had a video, uh, and the title of it was Brain Crack, which mm-hmm. was hilarious. But he had this whole video where he was answering a question that somebody asked, which was just like, are you scared that you ever, or are you running out, out of ideas? And he's like, I'm terrified I'm going to run out of ideas every single day. But it's better to just get them out than to hold them in. Mm-hmm. Because, like, if you hold them in, then you just, like, keep building them up over and over again until it becomes, like, this, you know, this this tray with rose petals and everything that everyone's going to clap for when you bring out. Yep. And you just, like, get addicted to these ideas that you'll get to later. When it's better to just, like, get them out. And I feel like that's that's, like, the best way to really convey how I try to approach mm-hmm. all of the stuff that I do. Like... Even if I, even if it's gonna suck, even even if you're doing something for the first time, which it's probably gonna suck the first time you do yep. it, you're gonna have you're gonna have an infinitely more experience than somebody who never does it. That's exactly where I was so, going. Is that yeah? By by waiting for this thing to be perfect, uh, I think people like to romanticize it. Is like I'm waiting until this this cake is perfectly baked and it's all frosted. No. And it's like no, you don't get there. Like you, you're you're scared of making a bad cake and that's really why you're not doing this thing. You're not yeah. waiting for the cake to be perfect. You're scared of failing and having someone look at you and say, "Yo, that cake is fucked up. I don't know what you did <laughs> yeah. to that thing." And uh, yeah, this uh, I guess very different analogy, but yeah, it's the same principle. Like uh, I agree that it's important to get ideas out and in the process of getting them out, we actualize them and by interacting with them, they become better and different than we were. Like, I think even in my head there's always the idea of like there's a music video treatment that I sit down thinking I'm going to write. And then as I start typing, as I start looking up reference images, it's like, oh, there's a little angle here that I would never have thought of if I hadn't sat down. Uh, and I'm thinking back. There's a there's a quote, I think, it's by Teddy Roosevelt that I always come back to. It's called The Man in the Arena. Um, and the the summary of it is just like the, the person in the arena has all the value. And the people in the stands can't say shit because the person in the arena is they might win, they might like lose, that. but at least they are in the arena taking the chance. Uh, and it ends on something like, uh, you know, at least be brave enough to fail or something like that. I'm forgetting. Yeah. Um, but it's like, at least you'll know. And everyone else is just going to sit there thinking, oh, I would have won that. And it's like, no, yeah. you weren't in the arena. You have no shot. Yeah, it's the classic uh, classic football thing. Just like <laughs> Monday morning anytime, yeah. yeah, anytime, you know, they drop a fumble. It's like, oh, come on. It's like, you think you would have done better, dude? <laughs> yeah. Like, you can barely get out of the chair without cracking every bone in your shins, you know? You don't realize that his, like, his collarbone's broken right now. And he yeah. still played three quarters Yeah, he's on still it. going, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, like, hockey players. Jesus Christ. Yeah, same. I had a guitarist in, like, my first band uh, was a hockey player, and he was tough son of a bitch um where was i going with what i was saying earlier i hate it when this happens dude it happens all the time down here this place (laughs) is a way of sucking thoughts out of our brain yeah that fan actually it pulls air out and ideas with it it's pretty unfortunate oh that's Um, what i was gonna uh, on uh, piggybacking off your teddy roosevelt quote mm -hmm. and uh what i said earlier about the uh yeah yeah. zay frank thing is that it's just like fucked up how the human mind is it's just like you can just like consistently convince yourself that you don't have the time or the resources uh, to do any of these it. things of course, yeah. when like you totally do and you yeah. have to take the chance eventually. This podcast is a great example of something that I wanted to do for a little bit and I was like, I just don't have time. I'm already I'm already making videos full time. I don't have time to have it build a studio in my basement and then to schedule more people to come over and make more videos with. And sure enough, for 41 weeks now, I've found time every single week to make it happen. I think I missed one week maybe and had two episodes, whatever, fuck it. But like the gist is maybe in maybe 43 weeks, I found 41 weeks that I could make this happen. But yeah, it, it's, it hasn't been pretty, hasn't been easy, and it took some growing and yeah, had some growing pains along the way. But like it is, yeah, you yeah, can find time, you can make it happen. It. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I think. And you've definitely, since the first couple episodes that I saw, you've definitely improved. You're I appreciate that. Like, yeah, I think I would agree with that too. And I think yeah. that's the other key piece is that we will improve at anything we do more than once. And in this, uh, you had to talk about the ideas coming out of your head. It's like, I think it's also important to get the first idea out of your head to give yourself a chance at idea number two mm-hmm. of like, as uh, I guess in the context of songwriting, it's like if there's only one riff, you're thinking about your whole life. You might it might become the perfect riff, the perfect solo, the I don't know, whatever the perfect means in someone's brain. But like, what would have been after that if you had just like stopped that? Uh, and I heard some other wisdom that like most of our ideas are done at eighty uh, percent, and I I think that's not quite perfect. But mm. I think the idea is that like for me in a music video, as I'm editing it, like there's a point where I'm just tinkering, and that last ten or twenty percent is I am changing how black the black is and how white the white is, and I'm adjusting this cut by one frame, and it's like. It, it matters. I don't want to say it doesn't matter, yeah. but in the context of what the average viewer of this video will see, 
that will never matter. What they yeah. will see is, was Euclid in the video? Did we see their faces? Could mm -hmm. we see their instruments? Like how red the red was is not one of the things that's going to make it on that list. Yeah, it'll be like, and it's so, a really nice red. And so I found that freeing idea for me that, you know, things are done at 80% and I'm hearing you kind of say a similar thing of like, it's important to get ideas out of your head because we can't make things perfect. At some point, they just got to be done and gone and you got to move on to the next yeah. thing. Absolutely. Is that a, a something you have trouble with in like your own songwriting? Like, do you ever find yourself getting stuck on on the one and trying to force it, or do you Absolutely. feel like you're good? Okay. Yeah, it happens all the time, and that's why what I've been doing lately is I'll get all these riffs together, and then like there'll just come a point where I know that I'm just like sitting there and just like playing with it. Yeah, and I'm just like, I'm just send it to the other members and just see what what can really mm -hmm. be put together because we do really work best when we're working together. Yep. Like. Um, Undone, the opening track on Revilement mm -hmm. was like, it was 50% me, but then Maddie just like wrote the whole riff in the end. Like I just did the kind of ambient stuff because I was messing around with uh, his old axe effects before we like totally redid it with his current setup. And then uh, after I heard the riff he put in there, we wound up getting Raphael Wayne Roth Brown who plays uh, cello for cello, Libris yeah, yeah. and uh, does his own solo stuff, which is brilliant. And, um, yeah, it just really came together. And even some of the other songs, like uh, Last Victim, like Maddie really, like, spiced those up. And uh, some of the other songs, like, I think Psychosis was kind of like a 50-50 with Boom and Maddie. Mm -hmm. And, like, you can hear, if you know them very well, you can hear exactly where one half ends and one half begins. That's interesting. But it's very seamless if you, like, just listen to it as a whole piece. So it's it's fascinating. I think we do work best when we're working together. Yeah, to me it's all cohesive, and I don't I don't hear a change of voice, but I've heard each of you guys say that, yes, we can hear this person wrote this song, and this was my my structure that this person helped with. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure it's all collaborative. It's not necessarily 100% anyone's at the end of the day, but uh, still it's cool that you guys have your own, I don't know, your own voices and your own way to bring your art to the table. Yeah. I think that's a much healthier way to approach it than having one person writing all the music and all your eggs are in that basket and i think it i don't know let's say if maddie i think maddie is one who's written a lot of music in the past or is very confident writing music maddie and boom yeah um, they're just juggernauts they've written even like from like early i doubt like they've just been writing for years and years and like comparatively i only have a small handful <laughs> of songs but i don't know i think the beauty there is that by at least tossing something else in the arena <laughs> tossing something else in the ring yeah. uh you're you're inspiring future ideas in them and letting them have more more thoughts and idea about what could happen uh whereas yeah, I think if you're just letting them go, there's a sense where Maddie's going to walk down the road and feel like he's walking the road alone. And by mm -hmm. having more ideas come in, it feels collaborative and helps you, yeah, feel united in this journey and also helps refresh him and bring better ideas into Maddie's head. Like, I think everyone wins by everyone contributing. It's not that it detracts from him or detracts from the voice. Like, I think it all still comes out cohesive uh, and it makes everyone's life easier along the way. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just, like, interesting to see what we can brew up, you know? Yeah. Um. Even, like, the fucking Beatles, you know? Like, John and Paul got to the point where, like, they, they hated each other, but they still made brilliant songs because they were competitive, <laughs> you know? It's just like, no, I can write a better song than you. And, like, I mean, that's a poor example of what we're doing, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, like, the same kind of design uh, ethos almost where mm -hmm. it's just, like, we're approaching it as, as individuals, mm -hmm. but coming out of it, like, as a team, kind of. Absolutely. Um, one of my stepfather's favorite things to say is the uh, the first time the Pats won the Super Bowl uh, before their whole dynasty happened. Mm -hmm. The first time they won with Tom Brady, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, I they all got introduced onto the field as a team. They didn't do, like, the player-by-player -player introduction. Mm -hmm. They just said, now the New England Patriots, and they all came on. And he loved that. That was huge <laughs> for him. Um, but I think that there is something there where, like, they were put forward as a unit. They were yeah. a team. They weren't yeah. a group of, you know, it was, they were all moving forward together. I thought that was pretty cool. I uh, heard something the other day. It's like, if you want to go far, go together. And that's, yep. yeah, the same, same idea there. And uh, now we have Kevin who composes too. So, I mean, we're just like, but we already have like two more albums written. <laughs> We don't even know where to begin, honestly. It's um, rough. <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing it. Uh, I wanted to transition here for a little bit to the, the Euclid shows. Uh, so there's the first show at the Webster and the headliner at dusk. Uh, and then, of mm -hmm. course, we're looking ahead to the uh, going back to the Webster and going to the main stage this time. Mm -hmm. uh, my um, my question for you there is, like, I guess what grew between the two shows? So you look back at the Webster as, like, a first show, and you have the, the live set that you have to watch. Uh, and then you have this headliner at dusk and yeah, it's a different venue, but I mean, it's a, I assume a similar set of six songs you were playing. Like it wasn't the drastically different thing, but, 
uh, from your eyes, from the Euclid perspective, like what changed between those two shows? Did anything grow? Is something you guys were working on behind the scenes that either did or didn't <laughs> improve at dusk? Like, yeah, what was the kind of time between those two? Like, so the first show was awesome. Mm -hmm. We had a great fucking time doing that. And it definitely was, at least for me and Kevin, maybe a little less so for the other guy. Well, I think probably Kowanowski as well. Mm -hmm. But, uh, like, Maddie has Shape Thrower mm -hmm. and was still gigging with them. First time he had gigged on guitar in a long time, but he's still gigging with them. And uh, Boomer was with Shape Thrower and is with Edict now, so he's gigging all the time, too. For us three, who have not been gigging regularly in a while, it was a little shaky. Mm -hmm. um, Matt couldn't get comfortable the first time, and, like, Kevin didn't, like, know what to do with his hands <laughs> and, like... I just, like, I wanted to move more, but I also didn't want to fuck up, and, like, I haven't had that kind of dichotomy in so long that yeah. I was just, like, I'm going to just focus on playing. Mm -hmm. um, and that stage, of course, does you no favors in solving that problem. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely not. Um, a little bit more in Dusk, but Dusk, we actually were playing more songs, and uh, they were a little tougher because I hadn't... We had, we, had a, we had a little bit of a hiccup in the, in the practicing mm -hmm. area for one of the songs. So I didn't move as much as I wanted to there, but I was still more comfortable. Can I ask, like, was it a, a sequence <laughs> of notes or like a, a pre-course that was hard? Like, was there a specific, like, just that you didn't practice the song enough or was there a specific? Uh, it's, it's just the whole song. Yeah, <laughs> the okay. whole song stuff. Like, after, after that song was done, me and Maddie just, like, looked at each other and I was just like, did you flub? He was just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, what, I, did, I did too. <laughs> would you give yourself the 95%, 99%, 90%, like? 80. 80, okay. <laughs> Good 80. Okay. So, strong 80. Okay. Um, I think Maddie probably played a little better than I did, but I also was just like, my hands were a little shaky that day. Sure. But all that is just kind of like small segues into saying that the first show was shakier. Mm -hmm. The second one, all the other songs, except for the new one, mm -hmm. Smooth as Butter, uh, Matt still said he wasn't as comfortable, but he definitely was playing and sounded more comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think that the the headliner at Dusk was awesome. That's one of yep. the best shows I've ever played, even back like when we were doing IDAT with Ben and mm -hmm. we were like playing made stage with like Kill Switch and shit like that headlining. Yeah. It was still like that headliner at Dusk was baller. I had an absolute blast. Uh, is there something specific that makes it stand out? Like, it seems hard that it would compare with a Kill Switch show, but yeah. I mean. Right, yeah. Um, well, I say Kill Switch show, but still it was like, a, I think it was like New Metal Hardcore, mm -hmm. uh, New England Metal Hardcore. Yeah, yeah, okay. So it was still like, we were playing like a dozen slots before that, okay, and there was still you, like a you, bunch of bands you, after us, but still we had main stage, and we were using like the back line and stuff. It was still mm -hmm. badass. Yep. Um, but like the Dusk one, there were a lot of friends. Um, there were a lot of new faces, and it was just like in a scene that I had kind of been brought up in. Gotcha. Uh, tagging back to what I had said earlier, or what you had asked earlier about my start, is I used to be in a metalcore band forever ago called Against Amber Skies, uh, which was just like we had like 16 Kill Switch covers and like a couple of August Burns Red covers under our belt. And so we were just like, yeah, we can write songs. And we were just ripping that out for a while. Um, and it was great. We played some great shows, but I mean, like, we didn't really know what we were doing. Of course. My, my gear sucked at least. <laughs> um, so, like, got drowned out and stuff. But we played with, like, Within the Ruins and, like, a couple other, like, some of the acts around there. But that's, you know, South Shore, Mass, and, like, Rhode Island. That's, like, my home mm -hmm. for, you know, all local shows. So that yeah. was just huge. It was, like, a return to form kind of deal. Yeah. Haven't played there in a long time. And there were a bunch of new and old faces and yeah, I just got to rip with my friends and it was a fucking great time and everybody was hyped on it, us and uh and the audience. It was incredible, yeah, yeah. It was a great turnout, it was a great turnout of other bands, like yeah, all all and went that well. venue was bad at those huge windows, dude. So it was sick. So cool. The best, yes. Yeah. yeah, from a content perspective, I was so happy when they opened that window because it was the best place to, to shoot from. Uh so it was great. Uh we are coming close up on our hour here. Uh I wanted to chat, I like to try and wrap up here. Actually. Uh, I like to wrap up with life outside of music. And before we get there, I want to touch on the Reddit piece quickly. Uh, you, We kind of talked about it earlier, and I meant to ask about it, and I wrote a note down and realizing now that I forgot to circle back to it. Um, I noticed as I was looking through like comments in your YouTube videos that like there are a lot of people saying, like, hey, Reddit sent me here. I talked to the bassist on Reddit, and he said, yeah. I think it's interesting. We talked about TikTok, and you kind of uh, – you said that, yeah, it's not your cup of tea. And for me, it's not either, right? Like, um, But I, when I hear bands talking about success now, a lot of times I'm hearing them say is, we had a TikTok that did well, and then our ticket sales did well right after. And I 
in my brain, those two things don't equate, but I've heard them so much that I've had to accept that like, there is something, there is some tie here. It's people are making money off this thing. Um, I'm hearing you say like Reddit is another one of them. And I've slowly come to accept that like the same way that we're looking at TikTok as this thing that like, we don't quite understand how big it is, but it is still huge. I think Reddit is another perfect example. And maybe the, the kind of opposite end of the spectrum of that, of like, I think it's equally big and equally enormous and equally influential and not obvious to people who aren't involved in it as much. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm hearing you say, yeah, are you, what do you do on Reddit to make things go well? Like, are you just chatting with people? Is it something that you've always enjoyed? Like I, yeah, I enjoy it as a social media without human connection. So instead of seeing my friends bullshit, I can just see everyone's bullshit. And that's kind of nice to me. Uh, what are you doing on Reddit that makes people <laughs> end up at Euclid videos? Um, so obviously I post, you know, our stuff, mm -hmm. um, but there are kind of, um, what would you call them? I guess there are like gates to how much you can self promote before like the mods are like, chill out. Yeah. Um, but even outside of that, it is nice to have a forum where you can have discussion with like minded individuals, obviously. Yep. That's, yeah. um, and you have like Facebook groups and stuff for that. But just the way that Reddit is formatted kind of lends itself to more of just like a full discussion rather than just like, you know, meme based kind of stuff that you see in a lot of Facebook groups. Yeah. Um, for instance, really like I'll just post, you know, something totally Euclid unrelated fairly commonly. Like I posted like a, a link to um, there's this band not out of Seattle, N-O-T-T, -T, and they're just a two piece and I, they fascinate me. It's just a drummer and a guitarist and the guitarist does vocals and they're sick. Check so I was just like gushing about them for like a couple of days. I would like mention them in like a, you know, lesser known band post and I would like post one of their videos and stuff like that. Um, so I try to like, I try to kind of face it the way that I know that uh, the front man from like the Acacia strain or like Trevor from Black Dahlia were, where instead of just like, you know, saying this is my band, this is this is everything. It's like, no, you should check out these guys too because these guys are sick. Or you should check out this band. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to like just like shove all this stuff down people's throats or anything, but I definitely want to like show everybody like everybody because it is kind of one of those like rising tide Absolutely. brings up all yeah, the yeah. ships. Because you saw that with Lorna, like, oh yeah, the uh, the, the just the viewership and the membership of the Deathcore subreddit. Um, alone went up like 30,000 members after To the Hellfire happened, it, like skyrocketed. It's yeah. insane. And that's another thing. You just get so many new kids mm -hmm. that are just like, oh, can you suggest me, like, especially on the Deathcore subreddit, like, can you suggest me a band all I know is like To the Hellfire or Pain Remains or yeah. something like that? Or, uh, oh, they'll just know like them and like Slaughter to Prevail. Mm -hmm. Or uh, you'll get like some like slightly older heads that are just like, oh, like you should listen to Worm Shepherd. They're 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 kind of like they're kind of like Lorna stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so you can just like, and I love just like compiling these huge lists of just like you need to listen to Fit for an Autopsy and the Acacia <laughs> Strain and these guys and these guys and yeah. Black Tongue. You know, just yeah. throwing like a million names at them. And then give him like the fur fans of for like every single one. And then my thumbs are cramping by the end of it because I just <laughs> typed a novel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, but it's nice. It's nice to like help bring kids up into into the scene, uh, even though it's not like in person, which was always the, the kind of interpersonal aspect of doing it is always fun. But um, being able to just kind of like help educate um, without – having to deal with the salary of an educator, I guess Absolutely. is pretty yeah, yeah. fun. Is there uh, some <clears throat> part of you that still identifies then with being that 16 year old kid who needed someone to reach a hand out and help explain some of these things or help extend? Or I think as I, as I find myself, when I catch myself in a teaching moment, what I'm realizing often is that the person I'm teaching is someone I identify with in the past uh, or identify past version of myself with. And what I'm really doing is saying, I wish someone gave me this, so I'll do this, and hopefully it pays forward. Is that kind of a similar I could perspective see, for you? Yeah, it's definitely not my only um, avenue or anything. But course, yeah, yeah, there's there's this kid from high school. Uh, his name was Wood, or his name was Anthony, but everyone called him Woody, and he was in Shout this out. like kind of punk rock band called Thirty Seven when we were like fifteen, sixteen, something like that. And uh, he was just a really cool dude who I mean, seemed super cool because he was in a band and we were in high school mm -hmm. and everything. And I'll never forget that he gave me like my first little uh, mix CD because he was listening to something. Yep. 
And he was just like, oh, you like don't know these bands? And he just like burned a whole CD for me and just gave it to me. And it was mm-hmm. kind of like a gateway into like <clears throat> starting to get into heavier music. Because mm-hmm. while I did listen to all the weirder stuff that I was talking about before, I hadn't gotten into, uh, I hadn't gotten into like Mudvayne, which was like my biggest gateway to playing metal bass. Um, I hadn't gotten into anything like uh, Lamb of God or uh, Between the Buried and Me or like any of these kind of like heavier acts like i was just like oh yeah corn's heavy yeah and then i heard like ruin and i was like oh <laughs> this is fucking heavy there's levels to this game yeah, yeah. <laughs> um hell yeah um last question for you as we wrap up yeah right at 59 30 so right on the money here uh, i like to ask about life outside of music we've had a lot about the bass stuff uh we've talked about music all yeah all those ins and outs here i'm curious what else are you into what other hobbies what other things make you happy i think i'm I'm bad at doing things. I'm bad at having hobbies, right? Like I, I like my work and because work is what I enjoy so much, like it's tough to do other things sometimes. I'm always curious, yeah, what do you what do you enjoy doing? What is something that makes you happy outside of music? Um, so since I live very remote from all of my friends now mm-hmm. out towards Buffalo, uh, I've been pretty avidly gaming with, you know, a lot of my friends. We have a Discord and stuff like that. Um, nothing What's the game? What's nothing, the one that's I was gonna say right it's now? it's nothing centralized. Like we don't like all have like a Minecraft server or anything What's, like that. What is the game in the last week that you can't put down? So we've been doing this thing uh, where we're port forwarding old Nintendo 64 games yep. and yeah. playing all those together. So it's been That's like uh, Mario Kart 64 and That's we sick. played like Monopoly recently <laughs> on a whim and it was it was a busted <laughs> janky mess, but it was <laughs> a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and other than that, yeah, I'm super into uh, tabletop games like uh, Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder. Yeah, and okay. I have this dream where I do like a, a metal uh, like podcast campaign, basically. That'd be sick. Where I just have like a bunch of different metal guys just playing Dungeons and Dragons or something around a table. I thought that would be cool as fuck. That'd be fun. Yeah. I am unfamiliar with Dungeons and Dragons, but it seems like something I would like it's if rabbit, I... It's a rabbit hole. I think if I... If this comes to the metal thing, if there was 10 guys I like sitting at a table, then I would jump in. But the idea to me of like pulling up a YouTube video and being like, <laughs> what is it? It's yeah. like, I'm never gonna... Like, I've tried. I'm never gonna learn it. Yeah. Uh, I used to play... I think it's called Heroescape as a kid. Okay, yeah. I'm, like, I was like RuneScape, Heroescape. which I'm still obsessed with, and I always got the two mixed up as a kid. Yeah. I think Heroescape was like a building game. It was like a... It was something kind of tabletop-y. Uh, and it always, yeah, struck me as like a... Dungeons and Dragons light, like a very like little kid version of it. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that's true at all, but well, if you ever check out uh, Critical Role sometime, that's like if, if it was like a Critical Role, but metal guys kind of deal. okay, because that's they're like the number one earners on Twitch and everything. They're killing it right now. That's another one of those yeah <clears throat> subgenres that I always un- yeah Dungeons and Dragons is so much more popular than I ever uh, ever it's understood. It's gotten yeah. huge. Yeah. Um, hell yeah, my man. I appreciate you coming through. Uh, I'm not going to try and say your full name again, but Zach, yeah, my okay. man, I appreciate you coming through. Uh, yeah, thanks for nuclear. having me on, dude. This uh, has been fun. Of course, dude. Uh, before we get out of here, where can people... So we got the show coming up at the web series. We got merch coming up. Uh, where can people find you online? Where can people tell you that you did great today? Where can people check out Euclid? Uh, where do we send people? Uh, well, we've got our YouTube channel, which has the River Pig video and all of our other videos. We've got, um, you know, you can find us. I believe we're under... Uh, it's either Euclid NE or Euclid Official, depending mm-hmm. on which site you're on mm-hmm. for... Uh, Bandcamp, Facebook, Instagram, the works. I, believe, yep. I don't. I don't know about the TikTok, but I believe you guys are on there. I think I was tagging Kevin <clears> in it, so I think it's Euclid official on TikTok as well. Um, for uh, Reddit, we don't have like a Euclid Reddit. It's just mm-hmm. me, which is uh, the Cash, which is the underscore C A J. Um, where yeah, I just kind of handle most of the band stuff there. I'll just post us in various groups. Yeah. So hell yeah! I assume there's music in the works. Nothing we can quite talk about yet. I'm excited to see what comes cooking up next. I know you guys have all been alluding to this this archive of stuff in the works. I'm excited to see it all come together and come to life, man. Uh, Thanks for coming through. I appreciate the time. Episode 41, Mission Accomplished.